So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces, where we talk with founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 141, which is a really great group chat that we just had with Duncan Cockfoster, who was previously the co-founder of Nifty Gateway. So Nifty Gateway is, of course, a leading NFT marketplace, and it was notably acquired by Gemini in 2019, where Duncan continued to lead it up until more recently. So this is a really great chat with Duncan, where we got to learn more about the founding story of Nifty Gateway, what some of the early challenges were when starting it, did a deep dive into it as a leading NFT marketplace, got to learn more about their hyper growth during the NFT craze, what the future marketplaces might look like, and also had a great group Q&A. So really enjoyed this conversation, and you're going to find it a great watch to the end. So Duncan, welcome to the uh, group chat. You know, I've been uh, looking forward to this conversation and uh, diving into all of your awesome experience with uh, Nifty Gateway for a while now. I'd like to uh, start off by saying, you know, huge thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, join us here today in advance. You know, so before we really jump into things, though, I think it might be great if you can uh, start off by sharing a little bit more on your uh, background, though, for the, those that might not know you. Yeah, absolutely. I can do that. Um, so my background, I've sort of always been a, an entrepreneur at heart. Uh, I actually started my first company when I was 13. And the reason I started it is because I was obsessed with Apple. I would watch all their keynotes and I really wanted an iPhone, but my parents told me that they would not buy me one. And, uh, you know, I was too young to get a job, child labor laws being what they are. So my only choice was if I wanted to get an iPhone was to start a business. And I started a company selling freshly, freshly made bread to my neighbors. And I think it was the perfect founder market fit because if a 13 year old shows up at your door and says, you want to buy some freshly made bread? I mean, you just can't say no, it's, it's a uh, too cute. And so I got everyone on a subscription plan, um, you know, had to figure out the operational aspects of using an oven, but the business totally worked. I achieved my objective and I bought myself an iPhone. So that was my first sort of taste of being an entrepreneur. And, uh, I think it was a very, very you know, um, inspirational journey and uh, even though I was a young kid, the satisfaction of being able to buy that iPhone has like really stuck with me ever since. Uh, then in college, I, I went to Emory and I was a computer science major there and I started a clothing company. We imported clothing from China and we sort of tried to be sort of a college friendly brand. And my experience from that really was that starting a clothing company was very hard because it was such a saturated market. So as soon as I got out of college, I got a job at Accenture, uh, but I really didn't like it. And I spent all my time working on my side projects. And as I said, the clothing company, we were in such a saturated industry. My goal, I said, okay, I'm going to start another company, but I'm, I'm going to do it in something that's very small. And I'm going to find something that I think is small and going to grow quickly. And that's how I got into crypto. You know, back then, and that was 2018, crypto had sort of gone through this hype cycle and it had been left for dead, which is amazing how history has repeated itself there. But uh, I specifically didn't want to do anything in finance. So I started looking at the non-financial applications of crypto. And that's how I came across NFTs. And back then, there were only a few thousand people in the community. But for me, the most positive signal was it's a very small community, but the people who are into NFTs are really, really into them. And they spend all of their time online obsessed with NFTs, talking about NFTs, buying them. So it was a very, very high... It was a small community, but the average participant in that community was extremely interested. And that's really what opened my eyes to the concept and, and made me think, oh, this will be, you know, a concept that grows. And we started Nifty Gateway was a very simple idea at first. It was really just we want to let people buy NFTs with a credit card. Uh, like all simple ideas, it turned out to be way more complicated than we thought. Specifically, the reason that, that was very hard is because the credit card companies had explicit rules against letting people buy crypto. And in 2018, trying to explain to a credit card company that an NFT was different from a cryptocurrency was essentially impossible. It's still difficult now. Back then, it was basically impossible. So the, the real challenge of getting that business off the ground was just uh, figuring out how to how we can process credit card payments. Um, and I think that involved a lot of scrappiness and a lot of iteration. Um, then eventually, we that, that business started taking off. We partnered with a number of prominent NFT projects to sell their, you know, to sell their NFTs via credit card. And we caught the attention of the Winklevoss twins who sort of made this proposal to my brother and I. They said, you know, come on board with Gemini and build this 
build this company internally. And so they acquired the company. And there's a lot of lessons in that as well. I think there's there's a few different ways to approach it as when you're a founder and your company gets acquired. We decided to approach it as, you know, we like this idea. We like the NFT space a lot. We're going to give it our best and we're going to do everything we can to build this company to have a success inside of Gemini and working alongside the Wake of Lost Twins. And it also helps that as part of our deal, um, we had basically had a, a deal where the more traction we made as a as a company, the more um, compensation we were unlocked. So we were basically incentivized to stick around and grow profits, grow revenue. And that's when we decided to launch NFT as, or Nifty Gateway as an NFT art marketplace because we thought art was the most compelling use case of NFTs at the time. I still think in many ways it's the most compelling use case and I can, I can get into that. Uh, and, you know, through the credibility and, and connections that we had with the Wake of Us Twins, we were able to convince a lot of artists to create NFTs for the first time. And I think that was really, that was a key factor in taking NFTs from this small thing that not many people do about to sort of this uh, media sensation and very mimetic uh, speculative bubble that ended up happening. So we were the first ones to release NFTs with people. Um, we released NFTs with Daniel Arsham, with Pac. You know, even the most famous, I've, I've learned that even the most famous physical artists are somewhat niche compared to other celebrities. So maybe those, you know, if, if you're familiar with the art world, you'll be familiar with those names. But um, yeah, working with them to create NFTs really helped uh, blow up the concept. And then we also worked with a lot of celebrities and sold their NFTs. So we did Eminem's NFT drop. We did an NFT drop of the weekend, uh, Paris Hilton, really many celebrities. And that was a very informative experience in itself because we learned that, you know, celebrities have a lot of reach. And obviously if Eminem does something, it's going to make headlines everywhere. But Having reach doesn't necessarily translate to traction, or if it does, it's maybe not the kind of organic traction that you need to have a stable growing business. So that was a very informative lesson for me. Um, and, you know, uh, as I'm sure you are aware, just being, even if you're a casual follower of the crypto market, the, we've now entered a, a significant bust for, for crypto. So, you know, Jeff and I, uh, went through a, a tumultuous period as many crypto companies did. Griffin and I had been there for almost four years at that point, And we decided that we wanted to get back to being entrepreneurs because I really liked working with the Wake of Lost Twins. As I said, when we enjoyed Gemma and I, we gave it our all, but we're really founders at heart. And so about six months ago, we left and now I'm working on starting other companies. And yeah, that's basically my background. Yeah, no, that's a really great background. And uh, thanks for actually, you know, taking us back to the uh, very beginning. It's cool to hear about the, uh, you know, uh, early kind of hustle story, you know. So I guess, uh, you know, mo most of us here, of course, I know of Nifty Gateway today. Um, but if we kind of go back to the very beginning, you know, as you mentioned, it was so, you know, being so early in this space, you know, what were some of the uh, kind of like first steps that you actually took to start as a marketplace? And maybe some of those kind of initial challenges that you faced? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, as I said, the initial thing that we did was very simple. It was, we're going to let people buy NFTs with the credit card. And we knew that that was a need for the project selling NFTs. And it was sort of, uh, I mean, to us, it was painfully obvious that, you know, credit cards are the dominant payment method in much of the world, um, this, the United States in particular. And you could only buy NFTs with Ethereum, which is intimidating, very, very difficult to understand. So for us, it was very, you know, this seemed like a straightforward value proposition. Of course, at the time, we didn't appreciate how difficult it is to work with payment processors. And that, that really ended up being the challenge of the business. It was operational. And so I, I think the way that we got started as a marketplace was we basically started off as something else. And then we had transformed into a marketplace by using the traction that we had. In our case, it was being a very simple tool. That tool was buy NFTs with a credit card. And that was our value proposition. And the difficulty of making that tool happen was that as I said, we had to find payment processors and explain to them that NFTs were different than cryptocurrency, which was, I mean, I, I don't know how often people have worked with uh, payment processors, but they're really, a lot of those people are not um, very imaginative. And so we would go to them and we would tell them what NFTs were and they would just look at us like we were crazy because 
NFTs are a really crazy idea. And in 2018, that was, you know, even more true today than it is today. Uh, so eventually we ended up, we basically just had four or five different payment processors that we would work with. And when one shut us down, we would switch to another one. So it was sort of like a living on the edge. And many crypto businesses have had this experience where you are in constant fear of getting shut down by your bank or your payment processor or somebody. So you have to have a lot of backups and you have to spend way more time than a normal company would making sure that your infrastructure, making sure you have a backup infrastructure. But, you know, for us, we were kind of lucky because that, that ended up being the moat that ended up being the reason no one else could offer payment and processing services because no one else was willing to, uh, figure out how to like get the backups in place and, and go through the, the struggle of spending dozens of hours a week on the phone with, uh, with banks. So we, we basically took the traction for being a payment processor and transformed it into being a marketplace. We had the credibility, we had some site traffic, uh, we knew people in the space and that's what allowed us to go to them and, and t say, Hey, we're launching this art marketplace. We really want to work with you. We've been in NFTs for a year. We think we could do a great job selling your art. Uh, and I also think what worked for us very well is we had the right strategy from the beginning. Um, we very intentionally model, modeled our marketplace after the physical art world. We took a look at the most successful physical art businesses, which are art galleries. And we noticed that they were all extremely curated. And so we said, we're going to build a heavily curated NFT art marketplace because um, if it works in the physical art world, then it's probably going to work in the NFT art world as well. And that, you know, that strategy ended up working for us very well because curation is a, at least when you're selling art, it becomes its own value creator. And we, we became known as the exclusive art marketplace. And because of that, the artists who were the most famous wanted to sell their art on our marketplace. And so it sort of became a self reinforcing prophecy. Um, again, the only reason or one of the main reasons that that worked so well is because NFTs were so small at the time. There was there were not many other people trying to become the curated art marketplace. But because we were early in that and we established our brand early on, it quickly became a self reinforcing prophecy. Um, and, you know, I, I will say though that that strategy had trade offs. And I think we ultimately, at the time, we didn't appreciate the trade offs. But the trade offs of using curation to get traction early on is that it's very hard to become uncurated. Uh, and I think this is extra true in, in art. So as we tried to open up the platform more later on, our early users got angry and they said, Hey, I, I use Nifty Gateway because you guys are selective and that makes me feel comfortable as a buyer. So I'm, I don't feel comfortable with you letting all these like artists on. So, you know, ultimately, uh, as I think is often the case, the thing that got us traction. We didn't really appreciate the downside of the trade-offs, but one thing I've learned is that there's always trade-offs in the business and, uh, you know, yeah, being curated is what got us traction, but, um, it also limited our options for what we could do in the future, which was a very valuable lesson for me. Yeah, no, certainly. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up the point as far as curation, uh, also kind of, uh, you know, dove into a little bit more. So that was uh, something I wanted to, uh, to, to ask about. I guess, you know, for a little bit of context, though, could you kind of like walk us through what the what the process is actually like when you, you know, when you onboard an artist and, you know, how they actually go through the process of, you know, creating an NFT and, uh, you know, maybe listing it on, on your marketplace? Sure. So I, I really do think that NFTs are unique in this regard um, and that NFT marketplaces, at least curated our marketplaces, they might be one of the only type of marketplace where uh, increasing supply actually potentially reduces demand. Um, and in this way, they, they are more similar to a physical art gallery than they would be to sort of a traditional, uh, online marketplace. So the way that we onboarded, we, we basically had a philosophy of like, you don't find us, we find you, um, we're in the scene. We would spend a lot of time on Twitter, looking up the best artists, and then we would send them a message and be like, Hey, we think you're ready for a, a nifty gateway curated drop. And for a long time, our brand was strong enough that essentially anyone we sent that message to, they would uh, they would freak out when they got it. They would be like, "Oh my god, I've," you, you know, they would feel like they've made it as an artist because they were working with Nifty Gateway, um, which again is, uh, I think that's very rare for an online marketplace. Um, and uh, 
it it's more reminiscent of the physical art world if you're if you get signed by a top gallery in the physical art world then it feels like you've made it as an artist and you know that you'll be able to sell your work for a lot more money because their brand is backing yours um so yeah that that was essentially the, the way that we did it and actually our process was almost hilariously manual for how we onboarded artists because we worked with so few of them we didn't really have the impetus to build out uh automated infrastructure and it wasn't until 2022 that we actually had an interface where they could go to upload their nfts um for really years people would just say hey here's the nft I'm, i want to launch here's the title of it and they would email us the video file and then we would go manually and on the back end and encode everything and yeah that that's because we really didn't have an impetus to automate the interface until we opened up the marketplace to more people because everything was so curated and and so uh manual yeah and uh and i guess uh, one thing that's uh, also worth noting is uh as far as like the the kind of mechanics of the marketplace right so uh you, you mentioned that you use drops uh, which is interesting as far as, you know, supply and demand in itself with that. But, um, you know, also, uh, did, uh, I believe you have secondary kind of sales too, right? So could you maybe share a little bit yeah. more about that and some of the interesting maybe dynamics that you've seen? Absolutely. So again, very early on in NFTs, we are, are thinking, basically we would show up to the office every day and we would say, hey, how do we how do we help NFTs break into the mainstream? Because there was still this niche thing that no one ever knew about. And so we were really looking for a path forward for the industry. And our strategy for to figure out that path forward was to study other collectibles industries. Because for us, NFTs were collectibles. They were very unique collectibles because they could be sent over the internet. But we basically said, these are collectibles the same way that a Pokemon card is or the same way that a painting is. And so what has worked in other collectibles industries that will work here? I mentioned that's how we came up with the curation strategy, but it's also how we came up with the drop strategy. Because we noticed that a lot of the most successful brands that sell collectibles essentially do it as an event and then they get a lot of free marketing from the fact that uh you know events have this compounding effect where if 50 people are going then they tell their friends you basically you get a bunch of extra people that show up and then if your event is based around the sale of an item and that item sells out really quickly then it's sort of this extra free marketing because people tell their friends they're like wow uh, you know that drop sold out so quickly really the the example we were following here was uh supreme where supreme is very famous for having these online drops that sell out insanely quickly and uh it's basically impossible to get one and we studied that and we realized wow this has been free marketing for supreme every single drop is not only a revenue generating event but it also gets more people interested in the next drop because it sells so quickly it's sort of like the digital analogy of walking by a store and seeing a long line you know, any person is going to look at that and be like, wow, what, what's in there? There's a long line. It must be good. Um, so we very purposely um, structured drops that would sell out quickly and then immediately rise a value on the secondary marketplace. It's actually much easier than it sounds because for any artist, uh, you know, let's say you're an artist and your last painting sold for $50,000. If you release an edition of 10 and sell them for a hundred dollars each people who collect you are going to be like wow this is an edition of 10 for a hundred dollars each that is an insane deal i will have to buy that because the true worth of that piece is actually much more than a hundred dollars and this is another thing that was taken straight from supreme actually where supreme basically they sell their stuff not anymore since they have new ownership but they used to sell their stuff is based well below the market price because they knew that that would get them free marketing and it would get them that sort of secondary market pop that happened immediately afterwards. So we we incorporated that strategy into our drops, and it worked. I, honestly, it worked beyond our wildest expectations. Um, but again, I would say that what we didn't realize at the time is that that strategy had trade offs. And really, the the big downside of utilizing that strategy is you it, you attract a lot of customers who are only there for the quick flip and. Their only purpose is to buy an NFT and the drop and then immediately sell it for more money. And that's actually not the sort of customer you want in the long term. You want people who really want to own this the stuff they're buying. And so again, you know, we I think the strategy at the time we were so happy. We were like, this is working, it's amazing, but we didn't appreciate the trade-offs. 
and we didn't appreciate the downside. Yeah, it's definitely uh, been interesting to yeah. see kind of, uh, you know, drops become more, uh, more commonplace now. So I think uh, one of the kind of key innovations is for, and maybe it's the role that kind of marketplaces play, such as Nifty Gateway, um, which is the royalties and, you know, secondary sales mm -hmm. uh, for, for artists. So could you maybe share about, you know, uh, about how that was with Nifty Gateway and, uh, you know, maybe some of the kind of interesting, uh, you know, insights from that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say that uh, every every new startup and every new innovation has to be better than what came before it. You're not going to beat the status quo by just improving a little bit. And royalties, it was not a concept that we came up with. It was already in the NFT ecosystem by the time we came around. So it, it really goes back to the early days of NFTs. Um, actually, I think you know you could probably credit CryptoKitties with coming up with this invention, where CryptoKitties had a, a specific marketplace for CryptoKitties that every transaction on that marketplace, the creators of CryptoKitties were paid royalties, and that's really I think where the genesis of the concept was. So on Nifty Gateway, every creator was paid ten percent, and. Yeah, as I said, every startup has every concept has to have something that's better about it. And when we when we went and talked to creators, creators said, you know, I'm especially physical artists. They'll they'll sell a painting at at their gallery for fifty thousand, and then that same painting will sell at some of the reasons for five hundred thousand, and they won't see a dot of it, and they feel ripped off. You know, they said this art this collector made so much money off of my work. This doesn't feel fair to me. I'm the one who created it. It wouldn't have happened without me. And so the fact that we could go to them and say, hey, NFTs have this feature where you can collect royalties on on uh, future sales of your work, it was very attractive. And it was the thing that for them, it was like, wow, you know, peop the NFT people really are building a better future for creators. You know, like this is a concrete thing that they're doing that is actually making creators' lives better. And it's actually a reason that this is better than the previous creative industries that came before it. So it was a very tangible thing that we could point to. Um, now, unfortunately, NF, you know, a lot of NFT marketplaces are moving away from royalties, which I think is a long-term strategic mistake. In the short term, they're moving away from royalties to sort of juice volumes and get people trading more, but it has the long-term impact of you know reducing creator interest in the NFT medium. It without royalties, like far few people are going to create NFTs. And so I, I just don't think the the short term revenue bump is worth the the long term uh, cost. And Nifty Gateway, you know, I'm, I'm no longer there, but it still enforces royalties. It's not one of the marketplaces that has gone away from royalties. And you know, as long as I have input, I'll always tell them that I think it's a huge mistake to do so because it's much better to attract creators to NFT NFTs long term than it is to get the short term boost of a uh, like lowering trading fees. Yeah, certainly. So that's probably going to lead to some uh, some questions we can get to the uh, group Q and A. But uh, you know, one of the things uh, that you did mention, of course, is you know be being early in the space and some of the kind of uh, you know the, the rise of NFTs and you know some of the market cycles, right? And uh, so I'd say you know in, in more traditional kind of fiat marketplaces, we might deal with like seasonality, but no nothing like the uh, NFT craze. I guess to like get a little bit of sense of you know what what uh, what was the kind of growth like that you were seeing, you know, maybe when it came to like transaction, you know, volumes or you know the kind of like a uh, month over month kind of growth during some of those uh, peak times. Yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, even hearing you ask this question is giving me PTSD um, because, you know, in a six month period from November, 2021, we went from a billion dollars of monthly transaction volume. And six months later, we were at a hundred million dollars of monthly transaction volume. So it was a hundred X growth in a period of six months. And there's no, you can't, you can't have a team that is scaled and ready for that. Our, our code base was still running on a lot of the like crappy code that I had written. So the amount of very good that caused in the system was enormous. And the amount of pressure, uh, it, it really was sort of um, just an unreal thing to witness. And then, you know, the really tricky part about those sort of market cycles is even if you, if you plan, cause, cause after we got to a hundred million, like you know, volumes crashed significantly and we were down to averaging like 20 or 30 million, still much higher than our 1 million. But, you know, if we built out capacity for that hundred million dollar a month volume, it, would, it was insufficient for, or it was extra capacity for like the 20 or 30 million. So it really was hard to plan. And this still remains an enormous challenge of crypto. It's such a boom and bust industry that's so volatile that it's really hard to build a business that's uh, ready for those ups and downs. Um, I would say my number one lesson 
from that. And the most important thing is to know know why your customers are doing what you're what they're doing in your business. Um, I mean, during that that market boom, I think we're we the team were a little bit uh, more in denial than we should have been about how many people were simply speculating on the prices of NFTs going up. A lot of people were coming in for the right reasons. Like a lot of people did actually just want to support artists and own the art they buy. Um, but a lot more people were just coming in to, to speculate. And I think, especially as first time founders, it's really easy to lie to yourself and to delude yourself about why your customers are doing what they're doing. But having a having a real understanding of, of what's motivating their behavior is really important. And it's even more important if you're in a, a boom and bust cycle like crypto. Because, yeah, a lot of, I mean, it's so many products in crypto will appeal to speculators, but they won't be building long-term value. And, you know, the, the speculation always has an expiration date. So we we got more and more focused on building long-term value the more that the business went on. But I wish we had made that adjustment earlier. And from a, you know, as soon as NFTs broke through to the mainstream, that had more conviction of, okay, we're not going to appeal to speculators because they're just going to move on to speculate on something else. We're only going to appeal to the people who are in it into NFTs for the right reasons and are going to be here in 10 years, are going to be here in 20 years. Because even if we miss out on some short-term traction, we'll be much better off in the long term. Um, very, you know, much easier said than done, but I think that is the one thing I would have done differently. And also, you know, maybe written better code because uh, the whole thing blew up much faster than I expected. Yeah, I, I can only imagine yeah, 100x growth. I mean, that's just uh, wild to hear. I'm sure, sure a lot of uh, sleepless nights as a, uh, as a founder, so... One of the things that, um, of course, makes some uh, marketplaces, you know, great businesses and uh, and very powerful is, uh, you know, the network effects that, you know, uh, start to kind of kick in. So, you know, when did you see that as you're starting to scale up with the Nifty Gateway? And, you know, how did that kind of start to play out, you know, at scale? Yeah, that's an interesting question, because I think normally, uh, as I said, like Nifty Gateway is a very unique type of marketplace being centered around curation and art. So I, I would say we did see it sort of a normal network effect play out where we had more buyers, so people wanted to sell. But we also saw a, intro, another sort of moat, which was uh, the best artists would tell, like the, the blue chip artists would tell their friends, hey, I worked with Nifty Gateway and it was such a great experience. Um, I think you should work with them too. And that word of mouth is actually what drove most of the value for our business. Um, and I think the, the key thing here is to really understand what type of industry you're in. In NFTs, uh, it's actually it's a, a mega power law where the top 10 artists, if you just look at who creates revenue, the top 10 artists will probably create 70% of the revenue, which is a, just an absurd power law. And so if you're thinking about building a marketplace, it's almost like working with the top 10 artists is all that matters because they drive the majority of the volume. and you could have the entire long tail and you would make you would not make nearly as much money as you would if you just had those 10 top artists. And so that's that's why for us um our business was very focused on the top 10 artists and uh that's how we you know we we just sat down and we did the math and we said this is how we capture the value. Um I I think that's not true of many other marketplaces. Like I don't think uh Airbnb maybe maybe Airbnb has a few large sellers now but it's, it's certainly not the case that there's 10, 10 sellers who account for 70% of the volume. Or I, I don't actually know the map, so don't quote me on this. But I think that's a very rare thing. I, I really think that only occurs in an industry like uh, NFTs. So th that was the most important network effect for us. It was the, the very small number of blue chip artists um, who are all friends with each other and all, all talk. And they really only trust each other. It's like they're not doing SEO. They're not... The only way to get them to work with you is to have other blue chip artists tell them to work with you. So that chatter between them was the most valuable asset our, our business had. And I think that was sort of how our, our network effect manifested, which is pr probably unconventional, but that was just the industry we're in. So uh, if your industry is different than others, you can't follow the conventional advice. You have to, to like go with what works in your industry. Yeah, no, that's uh, definitely a really great point. I guess, you know, on that note, too, uh, just to, to kind of go into another kind of topic. So, you know, with uh, network effects, um, you know, if, if those like kind of small group of artists or, you know, can be so valuable for you as a marketplace, then how do you think about like the kind of moat around your marketplace? Or, or is there one kind of in, in crypto, you think? Crypto suffers from, they're, they're really actually 
probably three major factors that I would say make mode building more difficult in crypto. Um, the first one is the like just uh, gross overfunding of the industry. So, you know, at, at the at the peak of the NFT bubble, it, companies that had a, you know a few million dollars of annual revenue were raising. 50 million at a $500 million valuation. And that just destroys unit economics in your industry. If if you have a company who's from the second they raise, they're making more off interest income than they are off real revenue, then they don't have an incentive to charge their customers anything. And I think this is an issue. It's definitely been an issue in marketplaces more broadly. I think in crypto is extra acute because BC is really just uh, got out of control for a brief period there. And so that overfunding has really made it hard to build moats because it's just very hard to charge money for for stuff when everyone is so overfunded. The second thing that makes it really hard is that a lot of the points of user friction that usually exist when you're building a marketplace do not exist in crypto. Um, for example, onboarding a customer and and KYCing them, you know, onboarding someone as a seller that's friction in most marketplaces. If you onboard someone as a seller, that uh, you know, you can you can count on them having some sort of switching costs and moving to another marketplace. Sometimes as a buyer too, but in crypto, you know, often, basically all the time, users just have a wallet and they just move from one website to another, and you know, they their wallet sometimes it even has their data that they take with them. So, essentially, the switching costs from moving to, from one marketplace to another are are very very low. And that makes it really hard to build a moat. And then the third thing is is really a, a sort of how sexy the industry is. As I mentioned, we did a drop with m M&M, We did a drop of the weekend. And a lot of people saw that and they were like, wow, I want to work with m M&M. Like, I love m M&M. He's so cool. And that just tends to drive a lot of people who would, you know, a lot of people who are looking to start a company, they'll just see that. They'll be like, all right, I'm gonna, I want to work with celebrities. So I'm going to start an NFT marketplace. So it created, you know, literally thousands of competitors for us uh, overnight. The, the sexiness of the industry did. did. I think um, boat building in in crypto is. I, I just went through some of the challenges. Now I can talk about some of the things that worked. Uh, brand was actually enormous. So, as I said, you're looking to capture those top ten artists. Very conservative about who they work with because artists are brands. I mean, just like any other celebrity, like Leo DiCaprio is not just going to show up in any random movie. He's going to be very picky about the directors he works with. And it, it it is hard to build that trust. So having a brand of those top 10 artists trust us, that was a great moat for us. And when when they were looking to do their largest sales, um, they would come to us because we were sort of a trusted brand that had a reputation and, and could work with them. And then I think there was also a scale economy there too, where... Uh, if you're capable, if you have a 20 person team who's capable of working with one of the, the largest, largest artists, then you sort of need to be constantly doing drops with them to pay the salaries for that team. It's not so easy. I mean, you know, with venture overfunding, it's somewhat easy, but if you're just starting off it, it's hard to sort of like get up to that, that team. So really just having a team capable of executing their ideas is in itself, it's some sort of moat. Um, and then, you know, I think this is still an early area and a lot of people are, are trying stuff. A lot of companies in crypto are building their own blockchain as a way to establish moats, which is a really fascinating thing to do, I think. It's sort of uniquely enabled in Web3. Uh, and that's really a recent trend that has only started this year. But if you have your own blockchain, people are less likely to leave you. There's like switching costs there. And I think that's going to be an effective strategy for, for building a moat. So it's it's still really early days and in Web3 mode building. I'm not exactly sure what will work. Yeah, no, it's definitely, yeah, def- definitely super early. It's uh, It's been uh, fascinating, though, to kind of like look at, like, I would say, you know, moats and the kind of fiat, you know, more traditional marketplaces and then what they could look like and kind of shape up to be for, uh, you know, for crypto and Web3. So, so we're going to get into questions right. here. Otherwise, you and I could probably just go on, you know, d- really diving into things with that nifty gateway. Um, but, uh, you know, right before we do, though, so you, of course, have some uh, pr- pr- pretty awesome uh, experience and, you know, kind of uh, also, you know, insights. Uh, building and scaling nifty gateway. So if you do you maybe have uh, any kind of tips for those that might be, uh, you know, in the earlier stages of building in crypto uh, or in the kind of NFT space right now, I would say my main tip is make sure you're make sure you have a concept that like will 
be sustainable and hold value long term. It's really easy to fool yourself. It's in any startup setting. I think it's easy to fool yourself into thinking you have a concept that will uh, be sustainable long term when you actually don't. I think it's much easier in in NFTs and crypto to fool yourself because there's so much, uh, you know, hype and speculation and people jumping from one thing to another. Um, so that would be my my main tip for anyone building in in Web three and crypto. And my other tip would just be embrace the weird, like don't. Don't try to make crypto into something it's not. You really you have to like dive in. You have to use the products. You have to like figure out the things that make this industry unique, because this is such a deep. It's such a deep area. Um, you know, you're not just going to be able to be a tourist and succeed. You're going to have to like fully immerse yourself. And I, I think this was true of the early internet as well. And the most successful internet businesses now, um, if you had told people how they would work in 1995, it would have just not made it would have been incomprehensible um and i think that's true of crypto businesses today like the crypto businesses that will be huge in 30 years i i bet that um if someone described them even to me in exact detail it would sound incomprehensibly weird and their vote would be like somehow their own blockchain or or who even knows what some very bizarre way of capturing value and so uh yeah i think you just have to embrace the weird and be open-minded and you have to embrace the fact that this is not going to look like other stuff before it. And um, it still has to make sense, but it's going to be totally different than other things that have come before it. So I think that's very hard, honestly. No, definitely. Yeah, those are some uh, great tips. That's uh, that's why this uh, recording will be fun to look back at, you know, even like six months, a year from now, right? Yeah. So, uh, hey, uh, Danny, do you uh, want to jump on? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Duncan, uh, for your insights so far. Sounds, um, sounds like you've had uh, quite a fun ride. Um, so I guess one of the things that you mentioned that um, I'm really curious to kind of double click on because I've been hearing it from a couple of other marketplace uh, founders is when you're talking about kind of that exclusivity and that curation that you were doing in the very early days. Um, one, how 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 early on did you start doing that? Was it once you had a bit of traction that you're like right, I can afford to start turning people away now? Um, and two, once you did start, you know deciding to turn people away what was the messaging and the way that you were kind of letting people down because i guess that's that's one one question that i've heard from founders a couple of times which is like right some of this supply doesn't really work for my marketplace so i need to turn people away but you know it's also a new product i also want to share it with their friends so how would you deal with that um dynamic right um the thing i would say about this is there, there's a real danger to being caught in the middle and we were very, we were fully curated from the beginning. And that was a part of our brand. That was our value proposition to buyers. We said, you know, if an artist is featured on Nifty Gateway, you can be sure that that artist is significant. And you can, the, our brand was built around the fact that our curation was good and that, yeah, um, artists, the artists that we were, were working with were notable. So I think going all in on that strategy works. I think going all in on being open and not turning anyone away works. I think it's really, really dangerous to end up in the middle and be sort of like half-hearted committed to curation and half-hearted committed to to a uh, not curation. So that that's what I would say is don't get caught in the middle. That's really the danger zone. As far as how we told people and let them down, I mean, look honestly, uh, that's the sort of thing where you just had to, you just have to say it nicely. And like rip the band-aid off you know there's no sugarcoating it there would often be artists that we thought were nice people but we didn't think were sort of ready for prime time and we would just send them a nice message being like hey we we like your work but we don't think it's a good fit at this time um you know we'll, we want to work again with you in the future uh you know like please stay in touch it's kind of like a vc rejecting people for an investment really um you know they'll sort of do everything they can to keep the relationship alive honestly though i would say that we our, we were very bad at rejecting people and especially because the volume of applications just grew so quickly so fast a lot of them we just didn't respond to and it was harmful you know we had a lot of hate on twitter artists who were angry with uh talk about how much they hated us publicly and i think it was definitely something that we should have improved and we should have done better and if we had been in like a a plus managed business we would have been very very polite and thoughtful whenever we turned someone down we would have responded to every application, et cetera. But, uh, you know, that was just kind of one of those things where 
when we were going through the hyper growth cycle, we just, we, we talked about what we had to prioritize. And that was one of the things that we had to leave by the wayside. And I, I will also say that, you know, um, artists getting mad at you on Twitter because, you know, they, they're not accepted into the marketplace. I, I don't think it really impacted our traction that much. I it, you know, it was definitely something I wish we had done differently, but it wasn't like it stopped our growth or anything like that. So it wasn't crucial. It was important to get right, but it wasn't like crucial for the success of our business to get right. What, what was crucial though, and I, I want to hammer home again is, uh, not getting caught in the middle. Like if you're curated, be curated and make that a part of your value prop. Um, if you're open, be open and make that a part of your value prop. But, uh, it's really easy to end up in a situation where you get the disadvantages of, of both worlds and neither are the advantages. Like I think the middle is really dangerous in this territory. So actually I had a, a question here. Um, and, and this probably brings up a, another topic that uh, someone actually asked in the com uh, community prior to the chat. Um, but you know, that's uh, as far as like the future with NFTs and kind of how you see, you know, aside from like visual artists, uh, maybe how like content creators. So for instance, you know, people that are like YouTube creators, how they can kind of, uh, you know, I would, I would say, you know, have access to kind of NFTs and some NFT marketplaces. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I I'm honestly biased here because I'm so passionate about NFTs as a creative medium. Like I, I really think that this is a, a very exciting art movement and I always compare it to the invention of the video camera. You know, it took a long time for people to figure out how to use the video camera to make compelling art. And at first they were just filming plays, but now, I mean, look at how many people's lives have been defined by movies and directors and how like impactful of an industry it is. And that's really the way I think about NFTs. NFTs are also a creative medium that is defined by a new form of distribution. Um, you know, movies for the first time, you could distribute them. Like you can't distribute a play really, but you could distribute a movie. And that's the core innovation of NFTs too. It's you can't mail a painting over the internet in 10 seconds. You can send an NFT over the internet in 10 seconds. And an NFT, you can interact with social media. It, it really has all these amazing primitives as an artistic medium. And Again, I think it, it's also it's it's also very common that whenever a new artistic medium gets created, there is a bubble. Um, you know, you actually see it all the time in art history, and this was a very public bubble and uh, you know very damaging for the reputation of NFTs. But I think eventually uh, people will become clever enough about using the medium that NFTs, sort of as the artistic medium of the internet, are going to come roaring back and. Uh, you know, take its place the same way that movies or, or photography have. By the way, that's not financial advice. Please don't go out and buy any NFTs because I, I'm saying this. And this is honestly one of the most annoying parts about crypto. It's it's whenever you're talking about the future you, and say, oh, I'm excited about the future, you have to caveat that and be like, please don't buy anything because I, I said that. Um, but yeah, so I'm very, I'm very biased about that specific use case of NFTs, which is NFTs as an artistic media. And I think that'll kind of always dominate mindshare. I, I actually think that ship has already sailed because most people, when you say NFTs, they think of these like art objects on the internet. They probably think of speculation too, but the term has really become connected with art objects on the internet. I think they will be used for other things too. Again, going back to my video camera analogy, video cameras are ubiquitous and they have all sorts of use cases, you know, like. If you're doing agricultural inspections, video cameras are a crucial tool. But when you talk about movies, people think about, you know, uh, Robert De Niro and uh, Leo DiCaprio, et cetera. They don't think about like a, a video camera on top, on top of an agricultural drone. And I kind of think that's how NFTs will, will go to. Right before I left, we did a, a deal with Starbucks. So we were the infrastructure for their loyalty program. Um, that's essentially a program where you complete quests and you earn NFTs. And then the more NFTs you have, you get to, you unlock prizes and rewards at Starbucks, you know, free coffee, all sorts of interesting things. And that was actually working really well. Um, they had a few hundred thousand users. So I think that's sort of, NFTs are great because it's almost like giving someone a, a t-shirt, but it's like this small little thing that you can send over the internet and people feel like a sense of ownership over it. And that's really why the Starbucks NFTs work, I think. Uh, it's like, oh, I have a Starbucks NFT. I, I feel some sense of connection to it. And the more I get, the more rewards I, I collect. 
So yeah, I, I do think creators will like figure out how to use NFTs a lot more ways in the future. I'm biased. I'm always going to love them first as an artistic medium because I think that's, I mean, I've, I've always been an art lover and uh, just seeing seeing that like I have a lot of personal relationships with artists in the NFT space. I just love the creativity. I love being around it. So that's always what I'm going to think of as like the, the core use case. But I do think in many, many, you know, loyalty programs, creators are going to like give them away as sort of little micro prizes. The, the amount of use cases is going to proliferate. Um, uh, it's, you know, and it's hard to figure out exactly how that's going to happen. But definitely a lot, lot of different use cases. And that'll be uh, fun to kind of see it play out. I guess on, on, on that, uh, one of the things that I'm, you know, really excited about too, is to kind of see the sense of community, right? Um, so that, that a lot of the kind of artists have, or even, you know, maybe if you think about like some of the musicians and, you know, other kind of creators. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I do think that's, uh, I mean, again, that's something that you can only do with NFTs, uh, instantly send everyone in your community, this like little object, you could mail them a t-shirt, but it's not digitally native. It takes a while to get there. Maybe it doesn't even get there for most of them. So. Yeah, I think communities and NFTs are another great angle. So we're gonna get in. Uh, we have time for one more question. Hey, uh, Brandon, do you uh, do you want to come on? Yeah, I'll come on real quick, Duncan. Uh, thank you for your insight. Um, as someone building a rental community for sneakerheads on the blockchain, a lot of what you said resonating resonated with with Supreme and payment processors. You kind of touched on my question a little bit just now, so I'll make it brief. I know art is what you're most excited about. My, my original question was, what other features of NFTs do you think you'll, you have some excitement about uh, moving forward? But moreover, maybe while you guys were building Nifty Gateway, what did you see also was striking a chord with maybe your members or, or some insight that NFTs could unlock more than the art? Yeah, totally. Well, I mentioned the, the loyalty program. That's sort of like giving out people who shop at Starbucks, giving them this little NFT, this little thing that makes them feel like they're a part of the tribe. Um, I think what you mentioned, your use case, uh, tokenizing like a real world asset and making it an NFT, I think that's actually getting a lot of traction too. And it's really picking up this year, especially because if you can figure out the Oracle problem and you can get it, you know, you can you make sure that the NFT can settle with the real world asset, then you can access this uh, global liquidity pool. Um, I'm, I'm sure you already know this to someone who's building a, a, you know, a market based around sneakers, but that, that use case is actually, um, getting a lot of traction this year. And I, I, I think, uh, real world assets on the blockchain have been this idea for a long time. It's always existed. Um, I think now it's just starting to take off, uh, and I think like US dollars are the first real example of real assets on the blockchain working. Um, where stable coins are, even in this bear market, stable coins are the one use case of crypto that's sort of like still growing. And it took a long time for that adoption to work. But now that stable coins are working, people are putting treasury bills on the blockchain and people are putting like sneakers and, and Rolexes. So I really think the main advantage there is being able to access a global um liquidity pool instantly you know like you have a NF, an nft sneaker you can anyone can uh get a loan against it instantly or there's really all sorts of interest use it as collateral i i think it's, it's still very early for that that case but absolutely that is a use case that a lot of our collectors were excited about a, a lot of people i know in the industry are excited about and it seems to really be happening in a major way this year again i think uh dollars led the charge so yeah, I think what you're doing is uh, is your timing is good, basically. Awesome. That's a great uh, last question to wrap things up. So, uh, so this is a really fun chat, Duncan. So, thanks for uh, you know taking time to join us and uh, you know walk through all of your awesome experience. And I know, I know it was a lot we kind of packed into the uh, to the chat. So, uh, you know, one one last uh, question I actually had for you though is, you know, that's a, it seems like a quite the experience, you know, building and scaling a nifty gateway. So, I'm sure you know you had to kind of take a pause uh, right after that. But uh, you know, what what are you uh, working on now? Yeah, I definitely did have to to uh, take a pause because I think um, you know startups are just like this very all consuming experience, and uh, yeah, um, crypto and NFTs have obviously been in this like giant bear market, and it was yeah. So uh, I've been traveling a bit, but now I'm getting back into the 
the startup game. I'm working again with my brother. Uh, we're sort of doing like a venture studio style thing where we try a few different ideas. Um, and maybe it, it's not formal. We haven't raised any money for it. We're debating if that's the right move or we should just keep it bootstrapped. But uh, for example, we just launched a new type of wedding registry, which is a wedding registry where all the gifts on the registry are received as cash. And then the, the newlyweds can decide if they want to return the gift and get the cash or they want to go through with the purchase. And we started that because our our friends got married and they ended up with a bunch of store credit at Bloomingdale's. And they realized they're like, wow, the retailers all just sort of aim to lock people into store credit. Um, they're not really doing what consumers want. They're just sort of taking advantage of newlyweds. So that, you know, that, that was sort of a, a fun idea. Um, it's, it's not crypto related, obviously. I think it's more a problem that we encountered and we were like, oh, this might be a fun experiment to try. Um, but yeah, I, I would say I'm easing back into it and, uh, sort of taking it easy. I'm not in any rush to get back to like, like stressful operational environment because, uh, it's stressful and, you know, it's nice to like, just chill out and travel and read. No, that's that's uh, great to hear though as far as you know back in the world of marketplaces so uh we'll have to do that as a uh, part two chat here in uh, in the future so but uh yeah thanks thanks again for uh, taking the time to join us here today and uh you know not, last but not least time for kind of quick plug where can we uh, keep up with you at uh really the best way is my twitter even though i'm uh, i haven't been tweeting as much lately sort of to go along with the sabbatical but yeah twitter is still my or i guess x now as it's called it's still my social media of choice even though uh you know, it's also going through a lot of tumble. I, I just think there's no replacement. I tried threads for a while. I found it incredibly lame. I couldn't take the brands just, you know, commenting back and forth at each other. So yeah, Twitter, my Twitter is DC cock foster. And, uh, I, I don't promise I'll be super active, but as I, you know, once things kick back up into gear and I'm working on new companies then I'll probably get more active there. Also, if you want to talk to me, DM me on the community. I, I love to hang out on the everything marketplaces community. It's a great group. We appreciate you being active there and your support. So you, you'll have lots of um, marketplace founders sending you messages, I'm sure, and kind of coming your way. So I'll, we'll also have to include a link to the uh, wedding registry. That sounds really cool. So we can check it out. It's a fun cool. idea. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks again for, for uh, joining us here today. And uh, thanks everyone for joining in on the uh, chat and the, and the great questions. Mm -hmm.